In this video, I'm gonna give you an overview of some various handheld PCs that I've collected over the years that I've made into custom Hackintoshes. Now, what I mean by Hackintosh, of course, is a copy of Mac OS X of some form installed onto a PC. Now, starting over here, uh, the first machine I'm gonna show you is a Toshiba Libretto 110 CT. And while not the oldest Libretto they've made, uh, the 110 CT is the best version of the old school Libretto, so the ones with uh, the original Pentium CPUs in them. And as you can see here, this particular one has a Pentium MMX inside. And I think that's about a 133 megahertz or so, though I don't remember the exact clock speed off the top of my head. Now, going over to the machine next to it here, this machine is also a Toshiba Libretto, as you can see. However, this one is considerably newer and is a Toshiba Libretto U105. Now, as you can see here, this machine has an Intel Pentium M CPU inside, and this machine runs at 1.2 gigahertz. Next to that here, we've got the very classic Sony VAIO UX, UMPC. As you can see, this is a handheld PC uh, with a slide-up screen that, reve that reveals a uh, very interesting and not all that nice to type on uh, little keyboard under there. Uh, but of course, this is a very cool machine, and this particular one is a VAIO UX 280p, which is one of the best ones that they made. Um, and then next to that, although not as small as the other machines you can, as you can see here, this is a Sony VAIO TX machine. And the reason I've included this in this lineup here is because the hardware in this VAIO TX is identical to the hardware in the Sony VAIO UX. Now, I found that quite interesting um, because it's basically a much bigger machine, though it is still a lot smaller than standard laptops of its era. And it also has a lot of features that most laptops its size don't have, such as an optical drive, cellular modem, um, among other things. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the Hackintosh demo here with the Toshiba Libretto 110CT. Now, while this machine technically wouldn't be something I'd consider a Hackintosh per se, um, it is still running an Apple-based operating system, and that, of course, is Apple Rhapsody Developer Release 2. Now, what Rhapsody was, was sort of an intermediate between Next Step and what we know today as Mac OS X. So it is quite interesting. And it was actually released in some form of a Mac OS X release in the form of Mac OS X Server version 1.0. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get ready with this machine and show you how it works. All right, so let's go ahead and power it on now. And this machine actually does have a working battery installed, as you can see here, it's not plugged in. Uh, but as you can see there, the clock battery is not good. I've actually taken it out because it was just starting to leak. Although it was actually still functional, um, it was indeed leaking. And of course, I wanna take that out before it causes any damage to the machine's motherboard. So let's go ahead into the BIOS setup here. And in order for Rhapsody, or at least the audio driver I'm using in Rhapsody to function, uh, the first thing I need to do is change the audio card IRQ to IRQ7 from IRQ5. And although the driver that I use supposedly supports IRQ5, uh, I think there's some sort of logic error in there somewhere, and the, it doesn't actually support IRQ5. So that's just some weird oddity that I found. But anyway, we'll go ahead and quit the BIOS setup here and boot into Apple Rhapsody. So you can see here, we're at the Rhapsody bootloader. Um, so we'll just go ahead and press enter to start up Rhapsody. Now I do have a compact flash card installed in this machine, so that's why you don't hear any hard disk sounds. And it might work a little bit faster than a standard hard disk though. The IDE bus in this machine, of course, is not very fast, so I doubt it makes all that much of a difference. But anyway, as you can see here, we're at the Apple Rhapsody login screen here. And one thing you might notice immediately is that the video driver is fully functional on this machine. Now this machine has a Neomagic video chipset, uh, specifically a Neomagic 128XD, I think is what it is, or a NM2160 uh, Neomagic chipset. And 
The driver for this was actually, first off, very hard to find. And when I did find it, um, it was a Next Step driver for Next Step version 3.3, which is basically the same as uh, this old version of Rhapsody. Um, it didn't work properly. But luckily for me, uh, the driver included source code with it that I was actually able to modify and fix uh, the driver that whoever wrote it obviously didn't test because there's no way it would have worked with some of the things that were wrong in it. Um, but if anyone wants to use this driver, it should work with any uh, Neomagic video chipset. Uh, I will put a link to my fixed version of it in the video description. So as you can see here, we've successfully booted into Rhapsody, like I said, with full color at the correct display resolution for this weird 800 by 480 display. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna go ahead and do here is head on over to About Workspace Manager, which will show us a little bit of the specs that are in this machine. So as you can see here, uh, it detects the CPU as an Intel Pentium, and you can see it detects uh, 65 megabytes of RAM. It's really 64 megabytes, I guess it just rounds up. And of course, the two gigabyte compact flash card that I have installed. So the next thing I wanna show you is uh, the configuration utility of Rhapsody. And of course, the same thing is the case in Next Step since they're very closely related. Uh, so go ahead and head on over to configure.app right now. That's located in system administration, and there it is right there, configure.app. And this is basically in Rhapsody and Next Step where you configure your system drivers. So as you can see here, the display adapter is set to Neomagic with that custom uh, Neomagic video driver that I modified. We can go ahead and take a closer look at it here. Um, you can see the display mode I have selected is that 800 by 480 resolution uh, with 16-bit color. Um, we can go over to the sound. And you can see for the sound, I'm using the Yamaha OPL plug and play audio driver, which this driver also was pretty difficult to find. Although unfortunately it didn't come with any source code. Um, so in order to fix that weird issue where it doesn't work with IRQ5, um, I'm probably gonna have to bin patch it, uh, reverse engineer it and bin patch it. So hopefully I'll be able to do that. If I am, I'll put a link to that fixed version in the video description. If not, I'll just put uh, the stock copy here that works with uh, IRQ 7, 9, 10, and 11 um, in the video description if you desire to use it. Um, now, I don't have a compatible network card installed in the machine, uh, but this particular network adapter I have selected here is what I have installed in another machine. I use that to transfer files over the network onto this install of Rhapsody since it's pretty difficult to do that any other way. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and quit out of this utility, and I'll show you that the audio is functional. Um, so to do that, I'm gonna go ahead into demos here, and they've actually provided a copy of QuickTime Player, um, ported over from Mac OS, it seems. All right, so now that that's open, we can go ahead up to the File menu. We can open, and there is a demo uh, movie file in here. We can open and play to demonstrate the sound. So as you can see, that works absolutely perfectly. And there's also some audio controls in the Preferences app, which are pretty basic, but I'll go ahead and show you them right now. So if we go to Sound here and open that preference. Uh, you can see we can control the volume, balance, and it also does have a microphone, which also does work properly under Rhapsody, so that's pretty cool. Um, you can see over here, we can select the different system sounds. And yeah, everything there works as intended. So the only thing I'm missing on this machine is a network adapter, which of course I will get a compatible PCMCIA adapter um, and that should fix that issue. So with that, let's move on to the next machine. And that of course is the Toshiba Libretto U105. All right, so we've got the Libretto U105 set up here. So let's go ahead and power it on. So as you can see, this one also has a bad clock battery. I've also removed this one as well. Um, and this one had actually started leaking on the board and actually caused some damage that I had to repair. Um, there is still some components that I'm not sure I trust in the battery charging circuit. 
Um, so I don't currently have a battery installed, uh, but once I fix those components, I'm still waiting on replacements, um, then I'll be able to uh, use this machine with a real battery. But for now, it works just fine without a battery installed. Um, so you can see here that it has basically the exact same BIOS setup as the Libretto 110 CT, which I find quite interesting. Uh, but there's nothing we need to change here, so we'll go ahead and exit now, and we'll go ahead and boot it into Mac OS. All right, so as you can see here, we're at the boot 132 environment that comes with uh, Mac OS X86. And the interesting thing about this is if you notice, it very closely resembles the bootloader for Rhapsody. So it was obvious that Apple took this, which this bootloader was actually originally intended for the Apple Developer Transition Kit when they were switching from PowerPC to Intel. Um, so we'll go ahead and boot up into Mac OS here. And another interesting thing related to that Apple Developer Kit is that this copy of Mac OS 10.4.1 Tiger was actually ripped straight from one of those machines. And the reason I'm running 10.4.1 on this machine is because the video adapter in this, the 82945, or no, sorry, the 82845 chipset or 55 chipset is only supported and only has drivers under Mac OS 10.4.1. So that, I found that quite interesting, uh, but that does unfortunately mean I can't run a later version of Tiger on this machine as I wouldn't be able to get full resolution uh, with this video card. Um, so now that we've booted up into Mac OS here, let's go ahead into About This Mac and take a look at the specs of the system. So as you can see here, it detects the processor as the Intel Pentium M, as I said, at 1.2 gigahertz with one gigabyte of system memory installed. And it's actually DDR memory that's in here, not SD RAM. Uh, I guess technically it still is SD RAM, but um, not, it is DDR, which usually OS X will say. Um, so as you can see, here is the uh, About This Mac window or system profiler. And you can see that it detects the same CPU there with two megabytes of L2 cache. And you can see the one gigabyte of system memory detected. So we all can actually go over to the memory tab. You can see it's detected there. It only has one DIMM slot and no onboard memory. Um, so the next thing we can check is the graphics displays. You can see it doesn't actually show what the video card is, uh, but it does have partial driver support. I haven't been able to get full acceleration working yet with this card, as you can see, uh, but it does have the correct resolution, of course, as you can see at 1280 by 768 which is a very good resolution for this small display. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead. Actually, the last thing I want to show you is the software section to show you what version of Darwin it's running. Uh, you can see here it's running Darwin 8.1.0, uh, which I believe is the first version of the Darwin kernel uh, compiled for Intel, unless you consider the Rhapsody kernel as part of the Darwin kernel, which it technically is. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and quit out of System Profiler here. I could hit the thing. The track point is a little hard to use on this machine. Um, you can see that the hardware support is pretty decent straight out of the box with this copy of Mac OS. You can see it detects uh, the battery here, although we don't have one installed. It detects that the machine supports a battery. And of course, the audio also fully functions. So you can see there, audio worked as intended. So yeah, that's pretty much all I can really show you on this machine. Um, so now we'll go ahead and switch over to the next set of machines, and those, of course, are the Sony VAIO UX and TX systems. All right, so we've got the Sony VAIO UX here, so let's go ahead and power this machine on. So as you can see, it has a kind of a cool uh, boot animation and logo there. Um, so as you can see, this one is running a more modern version of the Chameleon bootloader. And you can see it's also dual booting between Mac OS X and Windows 7. Um, but we're not gonna show Windows in this video, we're just gonna go ahead and boot into Mac OS. All right, and as you can see, this machine is all booted up and ready to go now. Um, so now, and uh, show you the About This Mac window. So you can see here, it's got a 1.2 gigahertz unknown CPU, as it says, 
Um, this actually, of course, is a 1.2 gigahertz Core Solo U1400. Um, you can see we've also got one gigabyte of system memory installed. And this is actually the maximum amount of memory that can be installed onto one of these. Uh, they have, of course, soldered onboard memory. And simply due to the way the chips are and how they're configured on the board, um, the chipset itself can't actually support more memory in that configuration. So unfortunately, uh, we're stuck with one gigabyte on this machine. Uh, but if we head into About This Mac, you can see it detects it as a MacBook 4 comma 1, which is kind of interesting. Um, you can see, of course, 1.2 gigahertz, 2 megabytes of L2 cache, 1 gigabyte of memory, and next thing we'll check is graphics and displays. So you can see that this machine has an Intel GMA 950, um, of course also integrated, um, with 64 megabytes of shared system memory, and yeah, the display resolution of this machine is 1024 by 600, which is actually uh, again, pretty good for such a tiny little display here. Um, you can see it does have a touch screen. You can see I can highlight stuff there. And we can go ahead and quit out of System Profiler right there. Um, so that's basically all I've got to show you uh, with this machine in, in particular. Um, now let's move over to its larger cousin, the Sony Vio TX, which of course, like I mentioned, has all the exact same hardware. All right, so as you can see here, we've got the Vio TX ready to boot up. So let's go ahead and turn it on now. And as you can see in here there, this machine also has that exact same boot animation and logo as the Sony Vio UX. Um, and you can see I've also got the exact same Chameleon bootloader, exact same Windows 7 boot or Windows 7 dual boot setup, and the OS X copy on this machine is actually the exact same one literally imaged straight from the Vio UX. I didn't have to change anything. The hardware is so similar uh, that everything just works. Um, so let's go ahead and boot it up now. All right, and as you can see here, we are now in Snow Leopard. And uh, so the first thing, of course, we'll do is head on over to About This Mac. So you can see here that this machine also detects it as a 1.2 gigahertz unknown. Um, it has the exact same CPU as the UX, the Intel Core Solo U1400. Um, but as you can see here for memory, I've actually got uh, two and a half gigabytes installed. And that's because this machine has 512 megabytes soldered on the board, uh, but also has one SODIMM slot, which I can use uh, to, of course, install more memory. And of course, I've got a two gigabyte module installed there. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead on over to more info. And uh, yeah, as you can see here, this machine also is detected as a MacBook 4 comma 1. Um, it's got the same 1.2 gigahertz, two megabytes L2 cache, two and a half gigs of RAM. So we can go ahead over to the memory tab here. And <laughs> it detects the memory slot, but it has this weird uh, hex here. This might actually be the ASCII um, um, model string of the memory module itself. So I'll have to check that later, I guess. Uh, but you can see it does see the manufacture of it as crucial. Um, that, of course, is pulled from the SPD data. Um, if we head on over to graphics and displays here, you can see we've got the Intel GMA 950 once again, the same 64 megabytes of shared memory. And the only thing different here is the display resolution, which is 1366 by 768, which again is another quite high resolution display uh, for such a small screen. Um, so that's pretty nice there. Um, and everything works as intended on both this and the Sony Vio UX. Uh, you can see we have working audio here. We have working Wi-Fi, working Bluetooth, um, and all that stuff is working as intended. Um, of course, we do have full graphics, graphics acceleration on both this and the Sony Vio UX. Um, so yeah, that's basically it with those two machines. So with that, that has been the complete overview of all of my little vintage handheld Hackintoshes you can see here. Uh, once again, we've got the Libretto 110 CT, the Libretto U105, the Sony Vio UX280P, 
and the Sony Vio TX in 15P right here. So that has been the complete overview of my custom handheld Hackintoshes. So I hope you enjoyed this video.